G'day guys and gal. No one likes having your denim pants taken away from ya. People also don't like getting infected with alien DNA, which turns you into a bold weirdo that worships genocidal space parasites. So it's absolutely no surprise that in the grimdark universe of Warhammer 40k, nobody likes gene stealers. Except for gene stealers. Gene stealers fucking love gene stealers. Although they can be considered a faction of Tyranid simps, they do have their own army, rules, and law. In fact, there is such little overlap between Tyranids and gene stealers, if it weren't for the fact that a gene stealer's wet dream is to be eaten by a Tyranid, you probably wouldn't even be able to tell that they were related. Before we get started, the major kill minis are back in stock, including the introduction of two new friendly faces, a remaster of the first ever major kill mini, and the first ever major kill team. See what I did there? That's right, three minis in one pack is now available. Remember how a few months ago I mentioned a competition, but it was, it was a bit loose and messy and one of the prizes was a gift card for GW? Well, with GW being a bit of a shit lately, on top of them not even functioning in Australia and New Zealand right now, I think it's time to change it up. New competition, better prizes. Whoever does the best paint job of a Major Kill Mini gets $500. Something like Tom's paint job would be a contender for this. The runner up will get $350 and the person who has the most fun and creativity with their paint job will get $250 as well. By fun, I mean something like this, where he made a comic strip using Major Kill Minis. Competition will run until the 1st of November, so a month and a half. Gives you plenty of time for the minis to arrive and plenty of time to paint them. Stock is limited and will probably sell out reasonably quickly. I'm working on really boosting the production behind the scenes so they never sell out, but at the moment it's just really hard to find Vietnamese sweatshop workers, so it's basically just a one-man operation. Today we'll go over the gene stealers, what they are, which races they can infect, and how they go about ruining your day, and finally, why do the Tyranids actually use them? Let's get into it. In 40k, there are subtle insidious threats, and then there are less subtle threats. Orcs, demons, and tyranids aren't hiding their true nature. You see them coming, and you clench your asshole tight. However, stuff like chaos cults and gene stealer cults will hide in the shadows, gathering their strength till they emerge in a surprise attack, destabilizing worlds in a single night from within. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The Tyranids are extremely adaptable, and they've found the Milky Way to contain a lot of very elusive prey. Many high fleets have fallen, attacking heavily fortified worlds, with no real option for espionage that probably could have made their lives a lot easier. Hence the hive mind developed the gene stealers to solve this issue. Now the time frame for gene stealers and tyranids is a little bit all over the place. Some lore has gene stealers been a thing before tyranids even made their way to the galaxy, but honestly it's not really that important. What is important is that gene stealers basically infect a human host with their own DNA by tongue punching their fart box before allowing them to return home with no memory of the incident. These initially infected hosts don't grow extra limbs and go bold and shit. They don't even start wanking off the Tyranid hentai. It has to be subtle at the start, otherwise people will be like, what the fuck? However, one thing that does change is their pheromones. Now what I'm about to say is technically headcanon, but I'm willing to bet Timmy's left nut that I'm right. People infected with gene stealer DNA are mega horny, and they become very attractive to people around them. Think about it. Imagine the gene stealers infected some ugly bitch who was asexual. It would completely ruin their plans for world domination. Unless the gene stealer DNA works some magic on them and turn them into a sex demon. It also explains why after only a few generations, gene stealer cults can grow to thousands if not more in number. Everyone just be fucking all the time. Also, if you plow someone when you're infected, you give them your gene stealer DNA and they become infected as well. So yeah kids, don't be silly, wrap your willy. Anyway, the offspring of each generation vary depending which generation they're born in. The first generation will look like these retarded alien wackos that are hidden from society. The second generation become more human and intelligent, but they still look way too suspicious to have around. The third generation look a bit off, but can pass as human if they chuck on a burqa, whilst the fourth generation can full on pass for humans no worries. Generally, before a gene steal uprising can occur, they will need to cycle through numerous generations so that they can start producing the nearly human gene stealers that come from the fourth generation. This is so that they can access high ranking roles in society. The fifth generation ironically shoots out a full blown alien as shit gene stealer monster that can rip a space marine in half. These big ass gene stealer monsters are the main goal of a gene stealer cult. If they can get to the fifth generation without being discovered, they have a really good chance at taking down the world that they're on. So who controls the gene stealer cult? The hive mind? Well, not really. 
See, the gene stealers are so successful because they don't rely on the hive mind, but can instead improvise a bit. They are, however, directly connected to a patriarch, which is this big ass pure strain gene stealer. The patriarch directs the gene stealer cult and empowers it. If a pure strain gene stealer arrives on a planet, then infects someone, it will become that planet's patriarch. But if a human is infected whilst in space or whatever, then returns home, that cult will need to wait for five generations of breeding before they get access to their first pure strain gene stealers, which will then become a patriarch. So the cults that start off with a pure strain are obviously a lot more successful. A fun little note here is that patriarchs are like their own mini hive minds. When a Tyranid fleet approaches a gene stealer infected world, the hive mind will inflict its own will upon the cult, but a patriarch can actually resist that for a time. There was a moment in the lore when a patriarch was so pissed off at the protagonist that it ignored the hive mind's call so that it could keep trying to kill them. This sounds like a defect, but in reality, it's just the price that the nids have to pay to allow the gene stealer cults to be so successful without daddy hive mind guiding their every step. What does success look like to a gene stealer cult? Well, uh, depends on what you classify as success. A cult will aim to stage an uprising by infecting large parts of the world's defenders, as well as having quite a lot of powerful gene stealers such as pure strains. If they're able to take over the planet, they will then send out a psychic beacon that invites the nearest Tyranid Hive Fleet to come past and eat the planet, including the gene stealer cult. This is the worst trade deal in the history of trade deals. The cultists are too cooked in the brain to process their impending doom, so they welcome their space bug overlords with open arms. Often the Hive Fleet will allow the pure strains to live, as they make great shock troops, plus they can be sent to other worlds to begin the gene stealer cult anew. So can gene stealers infect other races as well as humans? Well, yes, they can infect anything sentient that reproduces. On paper. In reality, not so much. The orcs don't fuck, so their reproductive cycle doesn't work so great for gene stealing. Also, orcs can tell when another orc is infected. The infected orcs just aren't quite right, and as such, they get cramped on the spot. Even if a gene stealer is able to infect some isolated feral orcs, they are still able to resist the mind control pretty easily due to the fact that they're orcs, and orcs just don't give a fuck. Hence, there are literally free brutal orc gene stealers out there that don't really know what to do about their, uh, situation. The tower are difficult to infect due to how their society functions. The ethereals can tell something is off about infected Tau, and they can even overpower the gene stealer's mind control with their own. The Eldar barely fuck, and when they do, it takes ages to produce children. On top of that, due to their pretentious psychic powers, they can sniff out gene stealer Eldar pretty easily. The only successful Eldar gene stealer cult that I know about was when an Eldar craftworld allowed themselves to get infected as a way to protect their souls from Slaanesh. Even their avatar of Cain got infected and actually turned into the patriarch of Cain. Yeah, needless to say, the Inari weren't a huge fan of this and fucking murdered the shit out of the craftworld using the power of their death god. So yeah, pretty much only humanity are ideal hosts. Space Marines can be infected, but due to their willpower, they can actually resist the mind control. They also can't reproduce, so they make very shit gene stealer hosts. There are instances of Chaos cults getting infected by gene stealer cults and just becoming these super problematic cults that don't really know who to worship, but those are pretty uncommon for some pretty obvious reasons. And yeah, the Necrons don't have to worry about gene stealers. If you want me to explain why, then you're a fuckwit. So how does one deal with a gene stealer cult? Well, if you can discover them early enough, they aren't that hard to deal with, especially if they don't yet have a patriarch or pure strain gene stealers. You would treat them the same as any other heretics. Multi-generational cults can be a bit of an issue, however, and they generally require a space marine chapter to handle it. By handle, I mean discover the location of the patriarch and blow that bitch to kingdom come. Losing a patriarch really fucks with a cult, and it makes them easy pickings. Once the gene seal uprising has begun, it's hard to beat. They emerge on their own terms, and they will often control large parts of the planet through political influence. Sometimes the local guard is able to put down the uprising, but that's pretty rare. Generally, the Imperium will just end up exterminating the planet, which is what happened in the Infinite and the Divine novel. One seriously problematic gene seal cult may have already doomed hundreds of worlds. See, they set up shop in a world that exports a ton of medicine, and they've been able to put gene stealer DNA in said medicine, which has been sent all over the sector. Huge fucking problem, as you can see, and I'm curious if that will eventuate. Knowing GW as I do though, I really fucking doubt it. I'm a bit on the fence about gene stealers. In early lore, they were their own race, and only became the Tyranids bitches later on. I'd almost prefer for them to remain their own faction. 
Too often, big scary things in 40k are later revealed to just be the workings of chaos, or now, the workings of Tyranids. Even on Katachan, it's actually implied that the scary fauna and flora there is a result of ancient Tyranids that were cut off from the hive mind. It's like, nah bro, just let Katachan be Katachan. Not everything has to be a simp for chaos or the nids. A huge part of Warhammer is the fact that there are no real good guys or bad guys. There are just races that really want to fuck each other up. Some of the most interesting moments in the lore are from Xenos killing Xenos or Chaos fighting Tyranids. It doesn't always have to be Space Marines, pew pew, bang bang. I really think there's a good lesson to be learned from Gene Steelers. If a hot chick with a long tongue and a strange hairline is keen on you, walk the other way. There's no chance a Warhammer nerd like you is going to get some that easy, unless she wants to give you the Warhammer equivalent of Super Aids. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be. Only $1 per month give you access to a boatload of hentai, which actually does include some ancient, low-quality gene sealer hentai. There, there you go. If you're on the Magikill Mini, now's the chance. The next restock will be some time away, and you could also win some cash. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more denim-taking content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.